Welcome everybody, my name's Tom Mellican. I'm a councillor at the City of Banyul and also the Metropolitan Transport Forum's Cycling Ambassador. For those that aren't aware of the Metropolitan Transport Forum, it's a collection of 26 of the better councils in Melbourne that meet regularly to discuss all things transport. And what we've looked at least recently is how COVID-19 has changed our world and people aren't driving as much as they were for commuting. Many people have discovered the joys of cycling for health, for transport during the pandemic. And from that, bike sales have boomed. Um, our shared paths are packed. And newly installed pop-up bike lanes have proved to be very popular. And the MPF's always considered that federal government had a role in promoting and funding cycling. And tonight, we'll be discussing with each of the parties and approach, their approach to leading so leading into the next federal election and, and their support for cycling. So we have four of the most, well, three current members of parliament and a hopeful member of parliament. And I think some of the better members of parliament in my opinion. <laughs> but, so we have Janet Rice, the Green Senator from Victoria. Welcome Janet. Andrew Hello. Giles, Labor MP for Scullin. Monique Ryan, Dr. Monique Ryan, sorry, independent candidate for Kuyong and the Honourable um, Kevin Andrews, MP, Liberal Member for Menzies. Each of the panellists have been given a topic to talk about cycling and the federal election. We did a, a ballot today to work out the, the order of speaking. And Monique, unfortunately, you were, your number came up first. <laughs> so you'll be speaking first. So Monique, Dr Monique Ryan, Independent Candidate for Kuyong, a Melbourne trained medical doctor. She heads the neurological department of the Royal Children's Hospital, highly motivated by climate change, and she's proudly not a politician. I used to say that too, Monique, but I'm afraid I've sunk it into the barrel. Mm. Um, and she wants to give people of Keong a real positive and independent voice. And she's also, I found out, is a very passionate, enthusiastic cyclist. So welcome, Monique. If you'd like the six minutes, you'll get a warning at five, at five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Tom, and thank you for the uh, invitation to join everyone tonight. I am a passionate cyclist. I have to uh, admit that I fall off my bike quite frequently, uh, and there are a few stories to be told about that, but we won't go there tonight. Um, I am very much engaged in cycling within Kuyong. I've been doing a lot of it recently, getting out and about with members of my campaign. And I, look, I think we all know about cycling in terms of what it can do for us in terms of the health and economic benefits of cycling for the community. So we know that better provisions for active and public transport reduce air pollution, they reduce noise, heat islands, greenhouse gas emissions, traffic vehicular accidents, and then social exclusion. Certainly in my electorate of Kuyong, yeah, the, the many wonderful trails and, and paths and there's a lot of activity in terms of weekend bike riding by children and their family members and more recently we've seen a market increase in the use of e-bikes and use of the bike paths by older members of the population. But before COVID only 1.5 percent of weekday trips were made to and from the city by bikes and post-COVID, as people have come back into the workforce and gone back to their workplaces, we're seeing them shun public transport because of concerns around that. And that has actually exacerbated pre-existing congestion, certainly in the streets of Kuyong. So I think it's a, a definite aim for us to, uh, as an electorate, to try and encourage people to become transport commuters as well as weekend cyclists. We know that people choose to cycle where they know that they feel safe and that they will base their decision to ride based on those appropriate choke points within or the most stressful parts of the journey and, and how they impact upon them on their daily ride. We know that if we look at cyclists in Australia, about 10 to 15 percent of your fast and furious who, who are very comfortable with it and do it very regularly. About 25 percent of people are never going to get on a bike and then there's the 65% of people who are, are keen to try it and perhaps to engage in it a little bit more effectively, but have some concerns about safety. And they're the people who probably we need to try to access and to engage more effectively in cycling. 
I would note that also in Kuyong, and I think it's true for the rest of the country as well, that the uh, sex ratio of people riding bikes regularly is two to one male to female. And I think it would be a real priority um, for most of us in the areas in which we live to increase the proportion of women who are actively cycling. Um, just before getting on to what we can do about cycling, though, I would also say that, you know, I was really interested to see that this forum is um, focusing very much on cycling in particular. And obviously, I think it's important to note that active other forms of active transport that are really important for all electorates in Australia uh, include walking. And we know that 90% of people walk every day and one in six trips are in total uh, achieved by walking. And I think it's important to to build uh, active walking into our active transport pathways in any discussion that we have. So what can we do? Um, very recently, actually, the Australian Society for Physical Activity identified three particular transport priorities for the federal election, which I think are really pertinent. And they are lower speed limits in and around our bike pathways and our schools, a 1500 metre safety route on the way to and around schools, and subsidy of e-bikes. So in the next few minutes, I'll just speak um, about each of those. If we talk about speed, we know that that is the number one cause of motor vehicle crashes. And that our local businesses, for example, will always benefit from having low, um, low speed walking friendly streets around them. Every year in Australia, there are more than 39,000 serious injuries and 1,100 deaths related to on, on Australia's um, roads and paths. And 13% of those at least could be reduced by decreasing the speed limit in certain areas to 30 kilometres an hour. The national benefit, the economic benefit of that to, to the country has been estimated at $3.5 billion a year. So it's really very considerable. And two thirds of Australians, when asked, do support decreasing the speed limit in residential streets to 30 k's an hour. The second thing we can do relatively easy is impose a 1500 metre safe route around schools. And that does include installation or ensuring there is a pedestrian priority crossing within 15, 500 to 1500 metres of all schools with a, with a, a, a designated no drop, drop off area immediately adjacent to the schools other than for people with a disability or a specific medical contraindication. So we know that two thirds of Australian One children- One minute, Dr. Ryan. Thank you. Live within five k's of their school. And then there's research that says that 1500 metres to 2000 metres is the ideal distance to walk to school. If we, we could put in a designated drop off um, zone around each school in Australia for less than the cost of the cross um, Sydney tunnel. And that would have a really Im significant impact on kids' safety. Just for, and then finally, e-bike purchase subsidies. There's lots of modelling to show that e-bikes are more and more uh, acceptable to people. They have lots and lots of physical and economic benefits, as well as the obvious benefits on our climate. There are uh, economic analyses that show that the cost benefit to the community of, e -bike, of an e-bike subsidy is as much as $3 per uh, dollar subsidy spent by the federal government on that sorts of subsidy. And we know that those subsidies are well in place in lots of uh, communities in Europe already. If we were to get, uh, provide a $1,000 subsidy for all e-bike purchases in Australia, there'd be a massive uptake in purchase of those vehicles. And that would um, apply both to middle-aged people, but also those elderly people are getting back on their bikes. Um, so I'll just finish by again saying though that I still think that one of the most valuable forms of transport is walking and that we should build that into all of our active transport plans as well. And that is very much complementary to our uh, support for cycling and for e-bike usage in our electorates. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. That's um, very good. So we go from our um, potentially newest parliamentarian to potentially the oldest parliamentarian or in years of service. So Kevin Andrews will be the next speaker. First elected in 1991 for the seat of Menzies for the Liberal Party. Often referred to, I think unkindly, as the father of parliament. He has had a variety of ministerial portfolios, including Minister for the Age, Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister for Social Services, and Minister of Defence, and also a very proud member of the Parliamentary Friends of Cycling. I've known Kevin and his lovely family for over 35 years before he was in politics and before I was in politics. 
I don't, and I'm proud to call him a friend and I don't think you get a more decent person and a keen cyclist. I think those two things go together, actually. So, Kevin, if you'd like to um, give us your presentation, that'd be lovely. You're on mute, by the way. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Tom. It's great to be with my colleagues and uh, Monique and uh, everybody who's participating in this forum um, this evening. Uh, as Tom says, I've been a keen cyclist for a long time. In my previous life, I commuted to work uh, in the city on a, on a daily basis. Uh, I've done a lot of charity rides, although mine pale into insignificance. I think I've done 13 round the bays. Tom and you've done 20 something. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I've also done a bit of master's riding and have a younger son who rode as an elite cyclist in the professional ranks uh, in Australia and Asia and a little bit in Europe. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, very committed to cycling. Um, and um, people have said to me, what am I going to do when I leave Parliament? I said, I can't cycle every day of the week, but I can cycle a bit more than I'm doing, I'm doing now. So it's great to be part of this. And it's great to see more and more people taking up cycling. I mean, you know, COVID is a sort of rotten situation we've been thrown into, but there are some silver linings from it. And one of them is that people have, I think, got out and engaged in community activities, including walking and cycling and other active uh, ways of uh, participating uh, that they may not have done so, um, so much in the past. And we need to try and build on that um, in the future. Uh, as Tom said, I'm part with um, Andrew and Janet uh, of the Parliamentary Friends of Cycling in Canberra, and we ride uh, and others presented uh, the group with a uh, submission for the next campaign. I'm not going to go through it in great detail as Monique has already outlined that at the present time. But I note in the covering letter from Stephen Hodge, uh, he said that we note that many of the COVID recovery and re regional development programs have in fact provided for infrastructure uh, investment in significant infrastructure for walking and cycling. And we strongly support such investments. And indeed, if you look at just the uh, local roads and community infrastructure program about of the 2.5 billion dollars about one third of that went to road projects and two thirds to community infrastructure and a little bit was overlapping between the two and uh, according to uh, the information I have is that about 20 percent of that actually related to active uh, transport whether it's cycling or uh, walking or related kinds of activities and indeed uh, in the guidelines it talks about active communities including active transport projects bicycle and walking paths, as well as skate parks, playgrounds and other sporting upgrade um, facilities. So that's that's all, all important. And how we build on it, again, um, is important. In, in those three transport priorities, uh, a number of them relate to the state primarily, but there is some overlap between the state uh, and the federation and the federal government as well. So lower default urban speed limits. Uh, you know, obviously, the states have got primary responsibility for speed limits uh, in relation to where they're placed and how they operate the 1500 meter safe routes to schools again it's a combination i suppose of both infrastructure in terms of pathways but in terms of they're having uh, pedestrian crossings and the like so again there's a combination there of potential uh, funding and e-bike purchase subsidy is something which obviously again uh, could be something which is uh, uh, which is a state or a commonwealth responsibility or some combination uh, of both so uh, that I know has been presented to the Treasurer and also to uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Transport Minister. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you'd like me able to make an election announcement tonight for millions, if not billions of dollars. But um, as Andrew and Janet know, <laughs> um, I might be leaving, but I'm still not so bold as to uh, preempt what might be uh, determined in terms of the election campaign itself, except to say that in, in the Parliament on a bipartisan cross-party uh, basis, there are a group of individuals who are very committed to cycling, are very committed to active transport, and I'm one of those, and I will be continuing to advocate uh, whilst I'm a Member of Parliament and even after I finish being a Member of Parliament for these sorts of activities. And uh, can I just finish up on this note of saying I'm very keen to hear tonight, uh, beyond what's been put there in the three priorities, if there are any other projects which people regard as important. When I drill down, for example, into what uh, we ride presented to uh, the government and to the opposition, uh, there was a list, I think, of something like 
50 or 60 particular projects from around Australia, which when I looked at the Victorian component of that uh, was $200 million to fund priority cycling corridors, bicycle superhighways in Melbourne and Victoria's regional centres. And I won't go into that. I think that was put forward by the RACB uh, as part of that a combined submission. Uh, and again, I think that's important to be able to look at these practical initiatives that are being put forward in terms of what might be uh, prioritised in, in, in the election campaign. And I think there's also an opportunity to oh, actually provide, thank you, provide funding in terms of existing programs. For example, every, every federal, and this is you know, small bickies, I suppose, in the terms of the overall Commonwealth budget, but every federal member, Andrew and, uh, and myself, uh, have a, a fund which we have some say over, the Stronger Communities Fund. It's, it's $150,000, but you multiply $150,000 by 150 electorates throughout Australia, and that's up to a significant amount of money. And, you know, for example, 20 or 30% of those projects, or even higher, were to go to active transport, then that's having an impact at a local a local level uh, in a way which is significant and important. So I'll, I'll stop on that note, but I'm very interested to hear what contributions there are from others tonight. Thank you, Kevin. Very, very, very well said. Um, our third speaker is Andrew Giles, MP, member for Scullin, first elected into the House of Representatives in 2013 in the seat of Scullin, which is not quite my area, so I don't get to see Andrew that often, but I, I certainly know his predecessor very well and a, a lovely man he was as well. Um, after a very successful law degree, um, Andrew decided to throw his hat in the ring and, and join as the member. He has also held several ministerial portfolios and, portfolios and he's currently the Shadow Minister for Cities and Urban Infrastructure. And even though Andrew's not my area, we have met with him several times and I know the MTF's met with him as well. And Every time I've met him, I've always been impressed by his enthusiasm, his knowledge, and his positive attitude to everything, and also his support for active transport and, um, and another keen cyclist. So very happy, and thanks very much for attending, Tom. Andrew. If you could give us your presentation, that'd be lovely. Look, thanks very much, Tom, and I should clarify, while I'm a keen cyclist, I am, uh, as a good Labor person, we like to divide ourselves on factional lines, and I'm very determinately in the non-Lycra faction. Uh, unlike some of my parliamentary colleagues, I just want to make that very clear, um, for good reason too. Look, uh, can I start just by acknowledging that I'm on Wurundjeri land, um, just back from, from Sydney, which was not enjoying very good cycling weather uh, today or yesterday. I'm going to try, Jane, and come in under the five minute mark, but uh, that's a politician's promise, so we'll, we'll see how we go. Uh, I just want to start um, by reflecting on what national government can do to promote cycling and indeed, as Monique said so well, um, active transit more broadly and, and to try and focus on the things that a national government can do rather than just go through a range of the things that I think are, are great ideas to promote cycling. And, and I, I'm pleased that Kevin touched on the work that Stephen Hodge and we Wright have done and I think the wider conversation that's played out in the parliament around the benefits of cycling and active transit. And I think the conversation shifted quite a bit in the last couple of years from a focus initially on the health benefits, then on uh, cycling's role as part of decarbonising our transport sector to a recognition that there are actually quite significant economic benefits from getting the policy settings right. And I think that's a really important piece of this puzzle, particularly right now as we think about our economic recovery from COVID. And I'm very pleased that the platform that Labor is taking to this election recognises both, both these dimensions, but, but also uh, sees in terms of our role as, as a major funder of infrastructure more broadly, um, sees that it is imperative that cycling and active transit be embedded in all infrastructure project planning that would take place under an Albanese Labor government. And, that's something that was a feature of the public transport investments that were made in uh, the Rudd and Gillard governments. And it's certainly a feature that I think about often in the extension to the Mernda line funded by the Andrews government, an outer suburban area where the facilities for cycling are first class, both access to the train station, which is an, often a really significant deterrent to cyclists um, outside the inner city, but also the facilities to, to store bikes, et cetera. So, one of the things that is important to me when we think about cycling and active transit 
is ensuring that it isn't seen as a silo, but it's embedded in our wider approach to transport infrastructure provision and thinking about how our cities work. And I guess that takes me to the next point, that we think one thing that is imperative that Australia's government should have is a national urban policy, and that that policy should really have three main pillars. Productivity, recognising that we are an urban and suburban nation and our economic growth depends on having our cities work effectively, um, particularly if we are concerned to see a return to the level of uh, productivity growth to drive economic growth, to maintain our living standards, to think about how our cities can function more sustainably and all of them, but also to focus on the livability dimension, which I think, I guess we've all seen um, highlighted through perhaps some of the more positive experiences of the pandemic. So having that, that framework, I think is critical because I think it will enable us to have more effective partnerships with some of the great initiatives that are taking place in the states and territories, but particularly in local government and through the work of bodies like the NTF. Not me, should I have the opportunity to be a minister picking projects from a list in Canberra, but setting signals that bodies much close to the ground can respond to. Uh, that, that's my sense of how we should be supporting active transit and cycling more broadly from a national perspective. I want to touch very briefly on the post-COVID world and its implications, because I think this is really exciting for all policymakers, but particularly when we think about active transit, because more distributed forms of work offer much greater opportunities to promote cycling and active transit, and relatively small-scale infrastructure investments can make a really big difference in a working environment where more people are working closer to home more of the time, whether it's in co-working spaces or in other configurations. One of the things that, that um, my boss, Anthony Albanese, has been keen about for a long time and has become increasingly debated is this concept of a 20-minute neighbourhood or a nearby hood. And it's something that we are determined to support with effective national policy making to encourage more people to do more of their work and more of their leisure closer to home. And a big part of that is facilitating cycling trips, not just super highways from middle ring suburbs into the CBD, but enabling radial trips within local communities to incentivise um, cycling more broadly and also to deal with that last mile problem that's a huge issue in a lot of public transport provision contexts. Uh, I think we are seeing I'm some Mr. Giles. calls around the world, um, particularly Paris, I think, offers some, some great lessons in that regard for policymakers here. Um, and, and I guess the last point I want to make is, is, again, to think about what national government should do and what it shouldn't do. And for me, a critical thing that will happen should a Labor government be elected the next election is that we'll bring local government back into national cabinet. We'll bring the perspective that only local government has to deliver active transit and cycling infrastructure and to align it with these broader policy um, objectives that national government should bring to bear and the broader approach to the provision of transport infrastructure and major urban planning and to fit that locally scaled uh, uh, sense of place into those broader objectives. So uh, I think I'm just under time, Jane, so I nearly got away with it. Thank you very much, everyone. I really look forward to the discussion to follow this. Thank you, Andrew. Well done. Um, and our final panellist, certainly not our uh, last, but our final panellist is Senator Janet Rice, Green Senator for Victoria. Previously worked for Bicycle Network as your inaugural Ride to Work Coordinator. And I remember those Ride to Work, they were lovely mornings. First elected into Maribyrnong Council in 2003, which was the year I was first elected and the first conference I ever went to, Flemington Race Course, Communities in Control Conference, a lady turned up on a bike and I turned up on my bike and she complained to me that there was nowhere to park your bike. <laughs> and we were friends, we've been friends ever since. And um, she's been a, a wonderful ambassador and a real driver for change. Well, in a time as mayor, when she was mayor of Maribyrnong in 2006. And she's also been a previous chair of the MTF. So um, she's had a long association with this group. So she was first elected into the Senate in 2014 elected again in 2016 and 19, Representative Green, a great friend of cycling and a good friend of mine. I'd like to welcome Janet Rice. Thank you, Janet.
Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Tom and Jane. And it's lovely to be here talking with the MTF family again. It's really <laughs> terrific. I also want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri land here in my home in Footscray and want to acknowledge all First Nations peoples and to be committing ourselves working for justice and for, for treaties and truth telling um, with our First Nations peoples. I also want to acknowledge that today is a pretty scary time with Russia invading Ukraine and just think and understand that sort of people's minds might be distracted away from thinking about cycling. Hopefully the world will be able to sort of pull us back from the brink of what looks to be a pretty serious situation um, happening in, in Ukraine at the moment. Um, but on the cycling, um, from my perspective, I reckon there are three core ingredients that are needed to revolutionise the sort of federal approach to cycling. And I also think as a Green Senator that you're not going to get them by voting for the major parties. The first one is passion and political will to be prioritising cycling particularly cycling for transport, as well as cycling for recreation and sports. But cycling um, for transport is, you know, that's the thing that gets short shrift in our transport planning at the moment. Which brings me to the second um, key ingredient, and that's actually a commitment to integrated transport planning. So bringing together the economic, social and environmental considerations and implementing and funding projects that are consistent with these, rather than funding projects that are election bribes, or funding the projects that the, build, the big tollway companies sort of decide that that's what they want to build. And the third key ingredient is spending sufficient money and actually putting the money to actually build the projects that are needed. I don't want to cover in my five minutes of why to cycle. I'm presuming that everyone knows why to cycle and you know, all of the reasons why we've all been such passionate cycle, cyclists over, over many years and presuming that yeah, because if you're here that you know that. So I now just want to go through those three things. The first, the passion and the political will, um, starting with myself and then the Greens. So as Tom has already mentioned in my introduction, I've been a commuter and utility cyclist since forever um, <laughs> and very much joining Andrew in the, in the non lycra fa faction. Um, I was chair of the Metropolitan Transport Forum, in fact, for five years when I was on a Maribyrnong councillor. I was the first year ride to work coordinator with Bicycle Network which was very much focused, not just on the breakfast, but bringing people together at their workplaces and behavioural change programs to encourage people to cycle to, from a workplace perspective. Um, I rode my bike to Canberra to take up my seat in the Senate in um, 2014, which was a great ride. I needed to get my bike to Canberra somehow. So I thought, yeah, let's, let's ride there. And, and in fact, my last job before I was in the Senate was as a strategic transport planner for Hume City Council. And so the Hume Integrated Land Use and Transport Strategy um, was my baby in the 18 months that I worked for Hume. Um, I held the transport portfolio for the Greens um, from when I was elected until last September, when I very reluctantly had to give it up in order to actually fit in taking on the um, responsibilities of community services, which on top of foreign affairs is a pretty big thing. So Sarah Hanson Young is now the Greens transport spokesperson. Um, from the Greens perspective, you know, there are lots of cyclists in the Greens and we have a policy commitment to prioritise active and public transport in our transport planning and to fund it. Um, so then moving on to my second key ingredient, and that's the need for integrated transport planning. I think it's all very well to say, oh yeah, you know, cycling's great. Yeah, you know, come and get a picture of me with my bike helmet on and sort of riding off around the, the um, path around the park. But then so often what then happens is it's ignored and really not funded to the level that it needs to be. And basically we keep on planning and funding car dependency in our cities. And that's the reality. And that's why even with the increase in people who discovered cycling through COVID, the number of cyclists that are using cycling for transport remains stubbornly slow because people know that there are too many barriers in the way and in particular that it's not safe. You need to commit to actually having integrated transport planning that would then um, implement, would, would then mean, would result in actually prioritising cycling and that means planning for it. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had integrated transport plans in every city, every region across the country and then had the federal government saying that they would fund projects that are consistent with those integrated transport plans. I mean, what would they look like? I mean, there's a really terrific example, actually, in the Victorian Trans Integrated Transport Act, you know, that has a vision that says, 
the parliament recognises the aspirations of, of Victorians for an integrated and sustainable transport system that contributes to an inclusive, minute, prosperous... Only one minute. Yes. Oh, goodness. An environmentally responsible state. It's got lots of wonderful objectives, but they don't commit to actually um, building projects that, that are consistent with that. Um, look, so I'll move on. And then, so the third big thing, of course, is funding. And I'm not going to, like Kevin, I'm not going to preempt our election commitments, but safe to say we took an election commitment in 2019 of a billion dollars for bikes over four years. And our election platform this year is not going to be markedly different from that. Might be a slight increase. Even. You just have to wait and see. And basically a commitment then to be funding projects that are consistent with that. So last year, you know, the last election, we wanted to see you know, networks of safe and continuous bike routes, end of trip facilities, bike storage, um, separated bike lanes, a really high priority bike infrastructure, but boosting bike tourism. There's a whole lot of stuff and you get so much bang for your buck if you're spending it on cycling. A billion dollars for cycling builds about a thousand kilometres of cycling, of good quality cycling infrastructure, it builds about one kilometre of a tollway tunnel. So I'll leave it. You need that. to stop there. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ms. Bryce. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, we'll move on to a bit of a uh, policy discussion. And the first one will be led by um, MAV President David Clark, Municipal Association of Victoria, for the people that are non-council related. Um, David is a councillor at Pyrenees Shire and also the president of the MAV. And, uh, a very good supporter of cycles. I'd like to get him on bikes a bit more often, but um, uh, if he could lead the next session, that'd be lovely. I'm not sure if he's on the link just yet. Oh, here he comes. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks very much, Tom. Really appreciate that. Let me just, I've just lost my screen here for a sec. That's better. Tom, oh, hang on. Sorry, you next to the... Can you guys see me? Oops. We can hear you, David, but we can't yeah, see you. On. Yeah, there. Have you got your camera on, David? There you are. Right, yeah. Have I arrived yet? Uh, not uh, yet. So it's it's it, it's a little bit of a a while to get the link out to where I live out the other side of Ballarat. <laughs> there you are. You're there now. We're good. Excellent. We're there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. And thanks for the, the opportunity to, to say a couple of words. And I, I think my job is to try and pull together a, a little bit of what we've heard, which is all very much, you know, to use a euphemism, we're all on the same bike, heading in the same <laughs> direction in that sense of things. So when I thought about this this afternoon, I thought, how do I actually throw a net over cycling and all the themes that fit with it? Because it, as Monique started off, at the heart of cycling, it is a form of transport. Um, but as Kevin said, there's the hardcore ones like himself that used to do the commute, and there's the casual riders like myself, probably more for that sense, or those that just go out to get a paper and a coffee. Clearly, it's a recreational pursuit as well. Um, and I was at Lake Mountain only a couple of weeks ago and was absolutely, the bikes were almost as thick as flies on the ground to see the people up there on the weekend was just amazing in that sense. But much more, it's a recreational pursuit in our own local suburbs in that kind of sense and what that brings in a health and wellbeing aspect. The, the thing that strikes me particularly as a, as a parent with young children is that it is so much can be such a family activity as well as being an individual activity and there's plenty of that, but there's also that like-minded group stuff. At MAV, Active transport is a key pillar of our roads advocacy strategy for the current election, and we're certainly seriously committed to actually helping in that space. But as a councillor, my, my look at this is, when I come to this conversation is, well, I'm an investor. I actually need to be an investor as a council and a councillor in infrastructure for cycling, which leads me to those two questions that are important. What are the opportunities to invest? And what are the barriers that we need to lessen or remove? And we've covered some of that already through the speakers, but let me just kind of put them in a bit of sense as I see them and building them from your local house up if you're thinking about investing. It is firstly about suburban connectivity in those rec both to the recreational and your retail opportunities in your own communities. Then it's about that suburban interplay into those retail zones 
whether it's bike lanes, whether it's bike parking, whether it's repositioning car parking and enhancing retail and cycling beside the footpath. So there's some big opportunities in that space. That leads into that into suburban cycling routes and connectivity to those. But particularly, where can these best be located to, to serve a cycling and potentially that broader active transport community, the number of you have mentioned in that sense. And finally, and I think it was, was Andrew that mentioned this in his, it's really very much often about that first and last mile. And mostly I deal with first and last mile in a transport context in, in dealing with freight, but it's equally applicable to cycling. Because I can now leave, if I lived in Avondale Heights, I can actually leave Avondale Heights, I can cycle along the Maribyrnong, I can get into Docklands and I can get up through the city pretty easily. But if I'm in Werribee, if I'm down more in the southeast part of Melbourne, I'm not quite sure that's quite as easy at this point in time. And then the other element, of course, to that is the, is the I think, the experiential tourism destination cycling experiences that are continuing to grow. So that's, that's the infrastructure minutes, stuff. Oh, good. All right. Well, that's good. So the, the barriers one I just need to cover really quickly and talk and that is really, as, as Monique and others have said, about safety and people's perceptions of safety in that context. So the question for the panellists I've got this evening is pretty simple, and it really is a play on what you've already given us. But here's council today, and we want to be your partner. Can you tell us what you'd like to partner with council in delivering for active transport, but particularly for cycling, please? Right. Um, I think we'll limit this to two minutes per response and we'll change the order. So Kevin, would you like to respond first this time? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, yes, in terms of partnering, I think that's quite important, Dave, and it's a valid point that, that you make. Um, I was thinking as you, were, as you were speaking, what really are the barriers, whether it's kids riding to school or somebody commuting to work, um, or even just going for a recreational ride um, on the weekend. And I think the number one barrier uh, above everything else is safety. Um, you know, even as I'm getting a bit older myself, I'm sort of more careful about, you know, I used to ride anywhere. Didn't worry me if it was a B double, you know, bearing down, you know, a, a meter away from me. Uh, I was, you know, fearless and um, invincible. Well, I've sort of discovered that that's not really the case after having fallen fallen off my bike a few times. So safety, I think, is the number one reason why people won't let their kids ride to school, for example, or are reluctant to go out on the road themselves. And I think it, what it needs is consistency in the infrastructure that's provided. Let me just give you one little example. Um, there's a pop-up cycle lane from where I, near where I live, um, in Heidelberg into the city along Heidelberg Road. But there are patches of that, that road where the, the pop-up cycle lane doesn't exist. And unless you get up on the footpath, which you're not meant to do, um, then you're, you're there with all the, uh, all the other traffic. Now, I understand why it's difficult to do that because it's a two-lane each-way road and it's very busy. And, you know, if you take half of it out um, for cycling, uh, motorists are not going to be very impressed and people's waiting time to get there is going to be uh, much slower. So I think what needs to be put into this is thought, what are the barriers, but how can they be consistently addressed and the problems solved in a, in a way in which all levels of government are working together? Thank you, Kevin. I think you're exactly right. Consistency and safety are certainly the big barriers. And the next um, response I think we'll receive from Andrew. Right. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I think it's a great question. And I think it comes down to hopefully each level of government doing a good job of staying in their lanes and, and doing complementary work. And I think our job is to set out broad policy parameters and to, to fund accordingly. And in this respect, I think there are really two things. We want to incentivise at a local level the sort of integrated uh, transit planning that can build uh, more effective nearby hoods, 20 minute neighbourhoods, local communities that are, that are walkable and cyclable. And, and at, a, at a higher level, we should be supporting any project that ticks the three boxes, that they're uh, drivers of productivity growth, if they're good for decarbonisation or sustainability more broadly, or if they promote livability. And I think that's obviously a critical part of the cycling conversation for so many cyclists. So 
we, we set out those parameters and we look to partner with local government and use their understanding um, to find the projects that meet those tests. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. And the next response will be from Janet. Thanks. It, it's a great question, David. And I think the first thing you required is that commitment and political will at the federal government that we are going to fund those projects. And then, as I said in my opening contribution, that we basically then fund projects that fit within integrated transport plans. And so clearly cycling comes up, will come up trumps all the time because it's cost effective and it's got so many benefits for communities to be funding it. And and essentially, I, what we envisage is to have a grants project that you'd have, here's this bucket of money, a billion dollars over four years. Local governments could put in um, requests for, for funding. And if they've got projects that tick all the boxes and they've got a plan that's been developed with the input of their local cycling community and the non-cycling community and taking into account all of the barriers, the safety issues, well, then those projects can be funded. I mean, a classic one, for example, today I rode my bike from home in Footscray to Mooney Ponds to meet the mayor of um, Mooney Valley. And I rode along Ascot Vale Road because it's the only sensible route to get from Footscray to Mooney Ponds. It's a Vic Roads controlled road. It's got no bike lanes. It's got trucks on it. It is not a, a road that I would be comfortable sending a 12 year old to ride along. So the sort of project, you know, you could easily redesign Ascot Vale Road, have Copenhagen style lanes, have the connecting up to council, have the connecting up the two activity centres, it would just make sense. And they're the sorts of projects that right across the country or putting sealed shoulders on country roads. So for example, you know, my, my son rode a recreational ride from Hurstbridge to Kinglake um, last weekend. And he was worried, he's a 30 year old, you know, he rides everywhere, <laughs> long bike rides. I was desperately worried about him riding on that road with the amount of traffic on it. But, you know, just sealed shoulders, for example, would tackle that. They're the sort of projects and how federal government should be working together with local government. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, and our final presenter on this topic will be Dr. Ryan. Well, I would echo, I guess, what everyone has said. And, and what I said earlier that, you know, what deters us from getting on our bike and riding somewhere is that one part of the ride which is nerve wracking or where you, you, you anticipate that you might come to grief. And I think as a parent, you know, you do the same thing. You, you worry about those bits that you know are a little bit more dangerous for the kids and you might stop your child from riding on that bike and normalising the behaviour of getting to school on the bike every day and getting home in that way because of the risk. And, and what minimises the risk is making those bits which are hair raising less hair raising and that involves planning to and committing to joining up the bits so that there aren't those bits that become a little bit more dangerous or deter you from getting on the bike in the first place. But as Andrew and, and Janet and Kevin have said, you know, you, you need infrastructure, you need infrastructure planning. So at the risk of being political, you don't spend $660 million on car parks immediately before a federal election when those car parks aren't want or needed by the community, but the community is begging you for, for bike paths and a plan that's consistent and integrated across different jurisdictions and, and the inner and outer parts of the city. So I think it comes down to forward planning and, and as Andrew said, you know, council, state and federal governments working together to do their bits, but to make sure that there's an overarching plan that maximises safety and enables us to, to normalise this as something that people of all ages feel that they can do safely. Thank you. I was about to say 30 seconds. <laughs> well time, Dr. Ryan. Um, I should acknowledge, I had it written down to do a welcome to country myself at the start of the meeting and I was too excited and too nervous. <laughs> I forgot, so I would just also like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. I am particularly, and um, I'd like to acknowledge them as the owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I'm sorry I didn't do that to start. It was very wrong of me not to have done that. So thank you, David, for your involvement and your question. Um, I look forward to more discussions at the MAV and um, maybe in your role as the... Victoria Members of the Australian Local Government Association, you could continue the discussion at a federal level in, in future. So that would be fantastic. So yeah. thanks. Thanks for your input tonight. Very happy, mate. When I can get a battery big enough, I'll be able to get over the pantlands and get all the way to Melbourne. But I've got to get a battery bigger for the e-bike. <laughs> okay then. So we'll move on to our second policy discussion, which will be introduced by 
um, Ryan, Lauren Peterson, PhD candidate, uh, Sustainable Mobility and Safety Research Officer at the Monash University about the latest research on how to encourage more people to cycle more often. So same, welcome Lauren, and um, if you could give us your, your views, and once again, we'll have two minutes from each of the panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Can everyone see me all okay? Yep. Great. So I love riding my bike, but that experience of feeling really unsafe while I'm riding, particularly in close proximity to motor vehicle traffic, it's been one of the major drivers of undertaking my PhD, where I'm exploring the barriers and enablers to cycling. In the midst of a health and climate crisis, active and sustainable modes of transport offer a wonderful opportunity to support easy and accessible physical activity as a part of everyday life. And the potential is huge. My research demonstrated that 78% of people are interested in riding a bike, but only in the presence of infrastructure that separates people from cars, such as off-road paths or protected bike lanes. That demonstrates that we have the potential to substantially alter the way that we move around our cities and local communities and that proportion was equally high in groups that we don't typically associate with cycling, including women and people living in outer urban areas. So what's stopping people? My research findings reflect my own personal experience. Nearly 60% of people note that riding alongside motor vehicle traffic and concerns about being injured in a collision with a motor vehicle stop them from riding a bike. There are also significant gender inequities in bike riding. Where for every one woman we see riding a bike, we know that there are two men. Women experience different kinds of barriers to riding, uh, where they're more concerned about riding on the road, where they feel vulner vulnerable to harassment from drivers and report not having the capacity or, and I really relate to this, just not having the time to be injured. And despite this, the majority of bike infrastructure is on road painted bike lanes or planned for the needs of recreational riders. And taken together, these and other factors contribute to a pattern where many bike paths and lanes are designed for the needs and confidence levels of men. We now sit in a position where the opportunity for transformative change in how we move about cities is more important than ever. And the humble bicycle has the potential for remarkable change in population and environmental health. But people are largely held back by a lack of safe and connected bike networks. 20 seconds, Ms. Pearson. These networks have the potential to substantially boost population, physical and mental health outcomes, reduce transport inequities and contribute to achieving Australia's net zero emissions targets. My question for the panel is, what are the barriers that you experience to enacting policy to facilitate this high quality protected infrastructure? And how can we as a community help you to overcome those? Thank, thank you, Lauren, that's a very good question. Um, we'll change the order again, given our opportunity. So Andrew, would you like to be the first responder this time? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I think it's um, a great presentation and a good uh, provocation for all of us. I guess the one reflection I might make on the gendered uh, dimension, I think Monique touched on this in her opening, is it's probably part of a wider issue where you know, our cities have by and large been built by and for men. And um, I know this is sort of an emerging debate in urban planning of which the, the cycling dimension is but one. I think the real challenge is firstly to get agreement that this is a problem, that it's the business of government and government at all levels to be solving, and then build uh, the stronger and uh, build a stronger evidence base, not just as I think most of us have been talking about to integrate cycling and active transport into both wider transport planning and the provision of public transport infrastructure more broadly, but to think about within infrastructure design what are the features of particular forms of design that shape um, the behaviours of, of potential commuters and, and recreational cyclists. 
And I think the presentation that you've made, while it touches on concepts that I think have been talked about, I don't think it is in the mainstream of public transport planning or transit planning more broadly, but I think it should be. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Jenna, would you like to respond next? Yes. I mean, basically, we know what needs to be done, and Lauren's presentation sort of outlined it. And people in local government know what people needs to be done. The communities know what needs to be done. And the overwhelming barrier for people cycling is safety. And in order to have safety, you need good infrastructure. In order to have good infrastructure, you need the dollars. And every local government probably that's represented in this forum has got an integrated transport plan that would have projects for cycling that they haven't got the money to fund. And I saw a suggestion by Councillor Crawford from Maribyrnong, my, one of my fellow Greens, is saying, you know, why doesn't the, gov the federal government could match local government infrastructure funding? Great idea. You know, and basically they're the sorts of criteria that could be used if you've got that big pot of, pot of money and the expertise and that political will federally to do it. And at the moment, we do not have that federal will at all. I've given up asking questions about cycling in estimates. I did for the first few years and basically they said, oh, we're doing nothing, pretty much. They said, oh no, we're building projects associated with road projects. And then you've got, and our oh, cycling project could be included in community infrastructure projects. Or as Kevin said, you know, you've got this bucket of money that each MP um, gets to spend. Well, I mean, I did the calculations on, on Kevin's dollars, you know, $150,000 per 150 electorates, about 20%, that's four and a half million dollars. That's not going to cut it in terms of funding the sort of cycling infrastructure that's needed in the country. So that's it, basically the barrier is that political will and then the determination to... 30 seconds, um, Senator. Yeah, but that determination to fund what's, what's needed. Okay, thank you, Janet. And our final boss, Dr. Monique Ryan, would you like to respond to, uh, to this question? Yeah, I mean, for me, the barrier to affecting change line is that I haven't been <laughs> uh, elected yet. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so I can promise everything because the moment I'm elected, this will all be sorted. You can all relax. No, I mean, obviously, that's silly. But um, yeah, I think, you know, and, and, and Andrew's spoken to the difficulties. And it's, it, it requires will, really, doesn't it? Because if you have the will, you'll find the money. And if you find the money, you'll be able to organise the, the process. But there has to be the will behind it. And that has to be, I guess, possibly maybe a bipartisan thing where people coming from different political um, sides come to together to achieve something which is clearly worthwhile and which would benefit people of all ages and both sexes from around Australia. So that will needs to be found. Okay, thank you. And Kevin, would you like to respond at all? Um, thank, thanks, Tom. And um, I think Lauren has reinforced what we've all been saying uh, this evening, particularly in terms of the barrier of being about safety and concern that if you get on a bike, you're not gonna have a, gonna, gonna be crashed into by a car or, or some other uh, vehicle. I, I, I might answer the question slightly differently because I suspect we're all have been saying the same thing, but m my answer is, and it could be about any other subject in which we're trying to affect change. How do you, how do you actually bring about policy change um, given that you know, we're all, all on the same, the same page? And I think there are three things in my experience that are important. Um, the first is that any sector wanting to bring about change needs to speak with one voice. If there are more than one voices going off in different directions, it's very easy for government or the bureaucracy or the public service to say, well, we haven't got an agreement about what we want to do, so that's an excuse to do nothing. And I think increasingly over the years, the cycling community has been speaking with one voice, but that's absolutely important in my view that that continues to happen. Uh, the second thing is that before you get action in terms of actual programs and dollars and cents, you need a rhetorical commitment to an outcome. Um, that is the, the rhetorical commitment is cycling is important, active cycling is important. 30 seconds. We should be overcoming these barriers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some people might say, well, that's nothing. It's not actual, you know, but if you don't have that rhetorical commitment, you won't get the follow-up in terms of actual uh, programs. And then thirdly, very briefly, I think 
um, it needs champions in every party to be out there working together and advocating for this outcome and that cause. And I would say that about most policy areas, but uh, it applies applicably to cycling. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Very good answer. And you got the thumbs up from Jane, so <laughs> that's good. So we're actually a couple of minutes ahead of time, but we'll go into the questions from the audience. And given we are a couple of minutes ahead, um, could any panellists would like to answer their question, if we could limit each answer to one minute, but also people ask, the questions will be moderated by Jane, so they will be um, limited as well. But given we are a bit ahead of time, I thought I'd take the courtesy of um, asking the first question. So, um, and we have discussed, given it's, and Kevin just touched on that as well, given that cycling does go across several portfolios, including health, infrastructure, transport, sport, and environment, and given that New South Wales introduced, recently developed a, a new ministry for active transport, and given the importance of cycling within our community and the role it plays and the increased rate of cycling right across cities and the towns, is it time we had a federal minister for cycling or a federal minister for infrastructure for active transport, if Monique had her way? So would any of the panellists like to comment about, because as Kevin said, it goes across many issues and you need champions. And if we had a minister for trans for cycling, that he would be or she he or she would be our champion. One minute answers, please, everyone. <laughs> I'm happy to start. I actually don't think that's the way to go. I think actually having a transport minister that's committed to cycling and has got cycling as a priority would be a better way to go. And in fact, even more than having a transport minister, having a prime minister, having a treasurer, you know, that's committed to funding cycling and actually having advocates, you know, throughout the government who are passionate about good, sustainable, healthy transport and transparency in decision making and funding projects that actually are what the community needs and wants rather than funding projects on the basis of election bribes or what the toll road companies want to fund and frankly that's the politics of it and that's you know nothing's going to change while we don't have that transparency in our processes yeah and if i might jump in i'll, I'll say two things one um i have no interest in telling um, anthony albanese should he become prime minister what portfolios he should give out but but i agree <laughs> I think it would be a backward step for all the reasons that Janet has set out. I think the way to boost cycling is to integrate it into a vision for how our cities and suburbs work and to have it siloed away, I think would be a really, really significant backward step. Would anyone else like to come? Well, there you go, my first question. I, I, tend, to, I tend to agree, Tom. Um, I think this has got to be a holistic approach rather than saying this is this little bit of you know one aspect of transport, so we'll we'll somehow boost it by giving the you know, the assistant minister an extra little title uh, on on you know what they do. I think you know I can see the sort of superficial attraction of that, but really this is this to to boost cycling the way we're all talking about. Uh, I think it needs to be much more holistic across across government. Thank you. So Jane, would oh talk to. Dr. Ryan, did you have one to make a comment? Well, I, I guess I would agree, but I'll also sort of potentially add that it's important to have the input from the other people who, who can make a difference in, in this process. So, for example, if we were to incentivise employers to put in appropriate facilities for their employees to have a shower at work and to do all those sorts of things at the end of the trip or to... Um, to perhaps you know to provide an e-bike fleet for their some of their employers as opposed to a, a a car fleet and things like that. You need the you know the tax people to be in on it, and I think you need the health minister to be in on it because there's clear benefits there. You need the education people to be there to to set up this safe zone around schools and to ensure that that that's there as well. And then you know the minister for women should be involved because this is an important health initiative for women to increase women's. Uh, active participation in cycling across that, that age span. So, yeah, I, I agree because I think that's, it's a really big thing and it's got lots of benefits in lots of different areas, but would need input from a number of people in that respect. Okay, thank you. One minute. Perfect. Ooh, sorry, that's my timer. Sorry, everyone. 
Jane, would you um, like to um, read out the first question? I yeah. will. Now, I'm just going to give everyone a bit of a heads up of what I'm going, to, what I'm trying to achieve here. Um, I'm trying to make sure that where people have asked um, specific panelists to answer a question, that I make sure everyone gets a go, that I don't focus it one way or another. I'm going to make sure we get a balance of questions as well from people um, around the room in terms of the little bit that I know about some of them. Um, but one of the things is gender. Um, I'm actually going to start off with a question that's come from. From, uh, Kate Preston, it's actually directed to you, um, Dr. Ryan. Um, there are some amazing concepts such as the Hawthorne to the Box Hill bike trail, but we struggle to get funding. Mm -hmm. Monique, how will you support these types of initiatives? And one minute in your answer, if you can, please. Well, I'm understanding that the completion of that path has been slowed down big because there's insufficient funding and it's because it um, crosses over different municipal areas and I think that that's where the federal the local federal members do have a role in in, in ensuring that there's in appropriate infrastructural support whether that's through uh, oversight from infrastructure Australia or through some other means that that's where the, the federal member does have a role in ensuring that there's appropriate support to to councils and state groups to complete these really important projects. Thank you. Um, next question is from Nathan, who is uh, on the subject of people not riding when they're not feeling safe. Um, proliferation of American style utes being something that doesn't make people feel comfortable. Um, question to all of the panelists. Tom, I'll let you decide which order they go in. Heads up. Um, what do the panelists think the federal government could or should do about these large vehicles? You're on mute, Tom. An interesting question. Um, who would like the first opportunity to answer that? Tom, I'm happy to. I'm happy to to lead off. Um, it, it's not just big utes. In fact, uh, my my biggest personal fear when I'm riding is those trailers that are much wider than the cars that are pulling them, and I you know a lot of times. You know, I've been, you know, this close to the trailer because the driver thinks, you know, they've got this much space, but the trailer's that much wider than the car uh, again. And, and, and they're, they're a great concern. So, um, but, it, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we've got, got everything from, you know, small vehicles right through to, you know, B doubles on our roads these days and often on quite busy suburban roads um, as well. And unless you've got that separation uh, between the cyclists and between the road users. I don't know whether it's a matter of, you know, what particular vehicles there are. You've just got to have the separation and that's not, that's not there at the moment in many instances. And that's, you know, one of the, one of the safety fears that everybody has. Mm. Yes, Tim? I'm happy to, to, to have a go. And look, I think just encouraging vehicles that are more fuel efficient, you know, having vehicle emission standards, having CO2 standards would actually discourage people from having really big, um, you know, petrol guzzling, diesel guzzling vehicles. But I think the reality is they're going to be there. So it is having the infrastructure that separates cyclists from those vehicles. You know, for me, riding in Footscray, I'm much more concerned about the B-doubles that I've got to share, you know, Moore Street just, you know, mix, which my street goes off every, if I'm riding down Moore Street every day than I am about sort of um, the, the, the big SUVs. So, yeah, I think it's actually having the infrastructure to separate cyclists away from those cars and, and investing in that. Okay, thank you. Maybe I'll just add in two additional points. Um, one, one is that I think while we all, I think are in headed agreement that separated cycling paths are the way to go, um, to understand in circumstances where that's not practicable in terms of route design, um, what can be done both in terms of you know, engineering design, but also to better understand and build the sort of evidence base that Lauren was taking us through about what can be done to shape attitudes and perceptions of safety as well as the hard data around safety. And I don't think in some of these questions we actually have looked at that hard enough. Okay. Do you want to go to the next question, Jane? Oh, I was on mute. Yes. Um, now, this question is from Richard and it's for um, Mr Andrews. Um, it reads, uh, my question is for Kevin. Neil and Bick and Manningham received $5 million each for congestion busting from the federal government, courtesy of the federal government. 
Not a lot of money went into bicycle trails. Were you hoping council would spend more on cycling infrastructure as it is congestion busting? Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, that, that funding was to try and ease traffic congestion at each end of Fitzsimons Lane. So um, at, um, at uh, Foot Street in Templestow, going into Fitzsimons Lane and at uh, Main Road, Eltham, the big roundabout there. Uh, Fitzsimons Lane's a four lane road, but at each end of it, you've got these choke points. So it was aimed uh, specifically at trying to ease those choke points. On, on the Manningham side, there's actually quite reasonable cycle paths that lead up to the river. Unfortunately, on the Eltham side, um, if you're coming from Main Road back towards the Yarra River going south, uh, up through the cutting there, uh, having ridden that myself, uh, it's not a it's not a path that I you know a route that I'd like to normally take at at rush hour. So there obviously needs to be some cycling infrastructure put in there. Uh, I th I think out of fairness to both councils Manningham and uh, Nilambic that uh, this was aimed at a specific uh, choke point so far as vehicular traffic was concerned. But obviously much more needs to be done in terms of cycle paths on that particular route. Thank you. I should have realised that was a question about your backyard. <laughs> um, my next question might just be a yes, no from everyone. Um, Murray asked, he says, Finland and France have a scheme for e-bikes for clunkers. Could GST be removed from e-bikes and bikes? Who would like to go first? Yes, Monique. Well, yes, or you could just, you know, or you could subsidise them, or I know in some countries there are schemes for promoting sale of secondhand e-bikes, you know, they'll start to come onto the market soon. I think that the, the thing to do is to increase their affordability because they're not cheap, especially for people who are retirees, but the, the benefits of uh, greater e-bike uptake as such that every step that we can take that to make it easier for people to access them and use them will will we'll pay off. Okay. Would anyone else like to respond? Oh, look, I think in terms of, you know, just encouraging electric vehicle uptake overall and, and e-bikes being a really critical component of that, um, as Monique said, actually making them more affordable, um, whether it's, you know, schemes for people to be able to pay them off when they're at work and sort of out of their weekly pay packet, all sorts of different ways that you could have to do that. Taking GST off them, I think, you know, something that could be considered um, but overall, yes, making them more affordable and and really, but, you know, people, again, aren't going to ride them um, or think that this is a, an option for transport unless they gotta, they feel safe riding them as well. True. Well, quickly, we, yes. we're also committed to, to boosting the uptake of, of electronic vehicles, um, which seems to be more popular now than it was in 2019. Um, but, but look, I'm... I'm Firstly, not here to announce any election policies, and, and <laughs> certainly that's not something that, that's currently in my contemplation, but it's something I'll have a bit of a think about. Okay. Thank you very much. Jane, would you um, like to go to the next question? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm having difficulty sometimes working it actually into a question and trying to make sure it'll be um, available, applicable to everyone. Um, so. Jim um, speaks about uh, one of the biggest challenges is attracting funding for major cycling projects that span several municipalities and the coordination to deliver these initiatives that can realize major benefits. It'd be great to attract the dollars and lead to deliver these game changers. For example, the Box Hill to Hawthorne um, rail, um, uh, bicycle path. Uh, so it's not really a question, but maybe a quick comment from everyone. And I'm sorry if that's in someone's backyard and I've given you a Dorothy Dixon. I'm trying not to. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start. I mean, that, exactly. I mean, getting councils to work together, to be putting such projects together. If you had a fund that was actually had the dollars in it to fund projects that stack up in terms of integrated transport planning, it would be the sort of project that would be funded. I think importantly, too, is funding local government adequately and we know that funding's been cut to local governments so that local governments have actually got the expertise so that they've got the sustainable transport planners to be able to be putting the, the plans together is another really critical thing and both at federal and state levels we've had cost shifting local governments really strapped you know with rate capping in Victoria so just having that expertise within local government to be doing that planning is another really critical element. 
maybe just to, you know an additional point. I mean, I've, I've emphasised that my sense of the responsibility of national government is to set objectives and, and to fund projects that meet those objectives. I guess the additional point I'd make is I do think we need to focus less on individual projects and more on places. Um, I've encouraged, I've been encouraged that Infrastructure Australia acknowledges this. It's something that we think needs to happen within national government through establishing a body which we call the Australian Cities and Suburbs Unit, so that we are not simply asking a body like Infrastructure Australia to look at the cost benefit analysis on whatever basis of a particular project, but look at the needs of a particular place and people movements and the sort of objectives we are trying to achieve. I guess that's the additional point that, that I guess I'd like to make beyond um, putting up projects for us to say yes or no to. I think, I think there, there's possibly even a role for the MAV here because, you know, if, if, if local councils um, quite properly are looking after the interests of their own ratepayers and the people who live within their municipality, um, who is it is actually working on coordinating this? So, you know, may, maybe there's a role for MAV uh, to be saying, well, this is what an active transport uh, map of metropolitan Melbourne or, or Victoria would look like. And these are the components to it. And these, these are the missing links that need to be filled in. And, you know, even here's our, our 10 year plan as to how you do it. So that if council A and B are getting funding in the first year, uh, councils X and Y know that in, you know, year seven or year eight, that's gonna be extended to where they are or, you know, fill in what they need as well. So I, I do think that, you know, there is probably a place going back to my point about speaking of one voice uh, for the municipal association to play perhaps a greater role. Okay. Thank you very much. Jane, do you wanna go for the next, next question? Okay, this is a question from John. Um, who uh, references the Northern Melbourne Northern Region Trail Strategy um, with 480 kilometres of new bike paths um, and a budget of 162 million um, and a lot more information as well. Is this the sort of project that could be fast-tracked for funding by the federal government in cooperation with state government? Hmm. Who would like to have first opportunity at that one? <laughs> I'll jump in and say uh, yes, um, but it's a bit bittersweet for me because I spent about five years seeking funding to get the trail extended from Diamond Creek to Hurstbridge and then a redistribution took both away from me, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is the nature of political life, isn't it, Kevin? <laughs> um, but I think that's exactly the sort of body of work that's been built from the ground up that, you know, where it meets those wider tests, we should be looking to fund. And, and I think also... These are the sort of enduring recovery projects that meet uh, the wider economic objectives that I think we are trying to achieve as a community as we look to recover from the COVID recession. Mm. And, and look, I'd just say, I mean, it really is you know, very similar to the previous question of being a project that if it stacks up, if it's part of an integrated transport plan and you know, ticks the boxes and it's been well planned and well integrated, which I'm absolutely sure it is, that then it's just, it should be a priority for funding. Um, and I'd just like to comment on that with, you know, Kevin suggesting that perhaps there's a role for MAV. I think there's probably more, it's a role for the regional associations and the state government and actually having state government working really cooperatively with local government on their transport planning, which I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit out of, um, I'm, I'm not up to date with how well that's working at the moment, but I've got a suspicion it doesn't work as well as it should. <laughs> I don't, Shane, do you want to? Bring up the next question. Yes, okay. So this question's from Nicholas, who kindly has identified himself as being with Bicycle Network. So you've got your heads up there, everyone. Um, so sadly, the annual number of bike rider fatalities has not changed significantly mm. in 20 years. What do you think are the key steps beyond designated infrastructure to reduce fatalities and get us on track to achieve Vision Zero for cyclists? <laughs> Designated, designated infrastructure. <laughs> I mean, you have beyond that, but go yeah, on. And, and it's not just, but it's, you know, it's not just in you know, the cities and having the Copenhagen lanes and all of that. And I know, you know, some awful tragic situations where people have been hit by, by trucks. But again, you know, going back to my example of my son, you know, riding from Hurstbridge to St Andrews and with roads that haven't got any sealed shoulders and just how 
how much you could improve those sort of country cycling routes just by having sealed shoulders and, and creating a, a safer place for cyclists to be able to ride and not have to be mixing it with, with cars that are sort of, you know, hooning at too high a speed, sort of, you know, going around tight corners and, yeah, doing a lot of damage in many, many circumstances. And it's not just the deaths as well. It's the injuries, which are just massive. And it's a real indictment on us that we have not managed to, to get the cycling death rate or injury rate down. Um, you know, it just has to happen. Thank you. Then Dr. Ryan. Um, I, I guess I would come back as well, though, to the fact that, um, that the single most um, strongest predictor of, of mortality in a bike accident is speed. And so getting um, speed limits in residential streets down to 30 k's an hour would have a significant impact on that. 90% of major injuries in, in cycling accidents happen without a car actually even being involved. So yeah, they're, they're on bike tracks, you know, people coming off because they've hit a pedestrian or, or for whatever other reason. So speed limits on bike tracks are also important as well. Um, and so... Um, even though we sort of think we, we all know of these terrible incidents that happen with people versus a, a car. In fact, just, I guess, due to the, the volume and the number of, tra of trips done on bike paths and things like that, most mortalities don't actually involve a car, so perhaps surprisingly, but we have to think about speed on, you know, in all paths where bike people are cycling. And, and, and moderating that to some extent would have an impact. And I do, I worry a little bit about electric bikes in that respect, actually, and the potential for people to, to struggle to control them at times, but that's something we can build into future planning. Okay, thank you very much. Can I, can I just add to that from a, a personal reflection, Tom and um, Janet, I've had uh, four, four accidents in which I've broken bones, only one of them involved a car. Um, I have to say, sadly, one involved a magpie. Vicious <laughs> creatures. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that feeling too, Kevin. Um, Jane, would you like to roll another question, please? I think we've got probably time for one last question. We'll see how we go. Uh, now, this is from an anonymous um, attendee uh, for the whole panel. If elected, how would you address the siloed nature of cycling? Mm. Can you repeat that again because it was breaking up? Oh, certainly. If elected, how would you address the siloed nature of cycling? Who would like to go first on that one? I, I, yeah. I, I'm not quite sure exactly what the questioner was asking, but if by siloed it meant various groups um, representing different interests or different outcomes, then my answer is the one that I gave before. And that is that if a sector wants to have a positive impact on public policy, uh, it's very critical that it speaks with one voice. Um, if, if that's what the questioner was getting to, then that's the answer I gave before. And I've simply reinforced that again. And whether, you know, I'm the lone lycra uh, aficionado here with uh, Andrew and Janet, but you know whether whether you're a liker or a non-liker, where we've all got to speak with one voice. Whether you're this representative uh, organisation of cycling or another, or you're part of the municipal association or whoever, uh, it's so important to speak with one voice. Yeah, I, I guess I, I had a slightly. I agree with Kevin, but I had a slightly different um, understanding of the question, which is really how do we fit it into how transport works, how transit works, and how our cities function. And, and I guess for me, um, the the first answer I give is is I'd like to see Labor's platform implemented, which embeds cycling and active transit in our funding and provision of infrastructure more broadly. I guess the other point that I'd emphasise is. I'd like us to focus on places and how they work and how people get around them, um, because I think that's a really critical way of dealing with the low hanging fruit here and that last mile, first mile problem as well. And for me, it's a matter of having that commitment and that political will to actually making sort of policy decisions based on good evidence. And so then, which then would integrate some cycling and active transport, not just into our transport strategies at federal 
um, state and local level, but also, also into our health strategies, you know, into mental health strategies, into city planning, um, all of these things, and which would then, you know, bring together so many elements of our public policy and sort of seeing cycling as, as a part of it. And then basically in doing that, create, helping to create the cultural change as well. And so cycling is just then normalised and something that everybody does rather than some strange thing that only a few widows sort of go off and do on weekends. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we'd better wind up the questions. Thanks for all people who submitted questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but um, we do need to finish on time. Um, so the next part I was actually going to just ask each of the, uh, the panellists for a bit of a two-minute summary of um, what they think, what their thoughts are, what their priorities will be, and um, closing your marks. So we'll reverse the order again. So, Janet, would you like to start off, please? Yeah, look, I think the, the critical thing is recognising that decisions on things like you know, how much funding you get, whether it's a priority, are political decisions and that there are choices to be made and different political choices will lead you to different political outcomes. And so that you need, you know, in terms of a federal election, when it's a chance to change the country, to change the government, you need to think about what those choices are and recognise that when it comes to if we want to have improved infrastructure, that means spending money, that's political. And so that, you know, you need to be, we need to be funding projects and funding programs. We haven't talked a lot about soft infrastructure, soft programs as well, you know, the behavioural change programs, they need to be funded as well, but have commitment to funding programs based on objective evidence, you know, having strategies, having assessment, evaluating them, um, rather than funding projects based on election bribes and on you know doing the bidding of your of of donors frankly and we've got to get that money out of politics and we've got to have transparency in our decision making so you know we don't get the 600 million dollars being spent on park, car parks that nobody wants rather than that 600 million dollars being spent on good bike infrastructure and i also think people really need to think about you know where their vote's going. I'm going to give a blatant political plug as a Greens candidate about the power of the Greens. This election's going to be close. You know, if you vote Greens, you can be helping to kick out the Liberal government and to be pushing a Labor government, if we're in the balance of power, to be going further and faster on really building a healthy and, and safe um, cycling future for us all. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Andrew, would you like to uh, summarise your feelings and... You're on, you're on mute, Andrew. <laughs> that was my best bit too. Um, so <laughs> offer, but we'll have a go ourselves if given the chance. Look, for me, um, there's a fantastic book by a British urban planner, uh, the late Peter Hall, which is entitled Better Cities, Better Lives. And uh, I guess that sums up my thinking about urban policy and the sort of things that I would like to be part of. To think about our national government can set principles and fund according to those principles to work in effective partnership with local government, with state governments, with community organisations, including uh, the people represented here, to think about how people can access all the opportunity and amenity in their city effectively on their own terms. And to think about the role and the extraordinary range of benefits that cycling and active transit more broadly has in that frame as something that can have a huge impact if harnessed on boosting our economic productivity. But something that's a critical part of our decarbonisation of our transit sector and something that's fantastic for livability, probably one thing that, that unites us despite our ideological differences on this panel. So that's what I'd like to be doing over the next three years. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Kevin, would you like to summarise your thoughts, please? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I won't repeat what I, I've said um, so far tonight. I, I think it's worth putting in perspective, and that is we've come a long way. If we we're having this conversation 20 or 30 years ago, um, it would be, would be different. And so what we need to do is to build on what success has been achieved over uh, the last uh, you know, two or three decades under governments of both political persuasions. And what I think is important is, as I said earlier, I think this post-COVID uh, period actually provides an opportunity because people have changed attitudes to a variety of things, you know, working from home, uh, the way in which they uh, meet together, the way in which they recreate 
um, et cetera. And I think this does give us an opportunity in some senses to reset uh, the equation. But having said, we've come a long way. There's a long way to go. Uh, I read a report today that said that on average, every Dutch teenager rides 2,000 kilometres a year. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the statistic for Australian teenagers would be, but it'd be way less than 2,000 kilometres uh, a year. And so, you know, there's the ideal of what can be achieved. And I think long as we keep in mind that if we work together, uh, we can achieve that. And from a political perspective, the reality is that when one side or the other of politics makes a commitment to do something, the other side usually follows to some extent. And so, it, in a sense, it can be an upward spiral in terms of what's going to be achieved. But can I just say, finally, it's been an enjoyable occasion to be able to participate in a forum such as this tonight. I think it's been very constructive. And um, thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you for coming. Um, Dr. Ryan, would you like to summarise your thoughts, please? Thank you. I was just thinking, uh, I completely agree with Kevin. We have come a long way. I'm one of seven. And my, I never had a bike as a child because my parents couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to buy bikes for all seven of us. And I reckon that's why I don't bike, ride a bike now because I've never been someone who rode a bike throughout their childhood and their adolescence and have felt comfortable with it, even though I really enjoy it when I do do it. And so, you know, we have come a long way, but if we want people to ride their bikes more, they need to feel safe on the roads and they need to have the infrastructure that we've all been talking about. And clear, clearly to build that infrastructure, we have to have councils, state governments and federal governments working together collaboratively and with forward planning for what our green, safer future looks like. And so, you know, we come back to politics, you get the government you deserve, you get the government you vote for. And so what I say, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else would agree, you should vote for the people who most represent what you want from your government and we're going to give you the things that you, you will um, be aspiring to within your community. And I would agree with Janet that, you know, the, the, the people who are more locally focused may well be able to deliver these things more effectively than people who have broader representation or broader, broader responsibilities. And so there's my small plug for myself. But thank you as well for having me. I've really enjoyed this and I've learned a lot from it. Thank you for coming. Well, well we are right on time. So I'd just like to thank the panellists. It's been fantastic. And it, you know, it's good to see everyone saying the same things, very similar things. And um, I was thinking, as Kevin said, a few years ago, we would not be having this conversation, but cycling has certainly elevated, I think the level of congestion and the people's concerns about the health and the planet have really promoted cycling to this point that we can run this sort of forum. But the other thing I would reflect on it, and there wouldn't be many topics we could run this sort of forum on where we would get such quality people all in agreement and all and working together and obviously enjoying each other's company and working towards a common goal. And there's not many issues or things we could act that that would achieve that. And I think cycling is one of those unique things that people, no matter where they come from, what political persuasion, see the benefits and will support it. So I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And the other thing I'd say, that there was a couple of comments about, you know, we put in the pop-up bike lanes, we lose parking. And there's this seems to be this us versus them sort of mentality in some cycling communities. Because I think surely we can make our roads safe for everyone who wants to use them. And that's, that shouldn't be that difficult. And we need to get away from, oh, if we take away a couple of car parks, make some bike lanes, then the, you know some people get upset. But we need to just say, we need to make the roads safe for all users and we'll all be better off if we do that. So thank you very much for your input tonight. Good luck to all of you in the next election. Um, we'll certainly be on your back still. Good luck, Kevin, I, as you move into the next phase in your life. Thank, and you know, you've had an incredible length of service to this country in your time in parliament and you know it's a well a well-deserved rest i think is, is um you, you deserve a good a, a long rest and um and maybe you will be able to ride your bike a bit also i'd like to thank lauren and um david for their input as well and for greg and jane for organizing this tonight it's been been really fascinating and really enjoyable so thanks everyone for all that also I'd like to mention jonathan at the chair of the mtf is also on and um yeah, really enjoyed tonight's discussion. Really looking forward to what the promises and the expectations and the, the raising of cycling to a, be a major form.